I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> come on, you're boring yourself to death. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, you got a picture of Lama James like playing the drums or something. Yeah. I was like, he doesn't play the drums, he plays the keys. And he's like, Lama James on the keytar then. <laughs> Deceptively, we're misunderstanding how things how things exist. So they say ultimate truth is emptiness, and deceptive truth is nominal reality. Everything that exists in the eternal. So, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, but deceptive truth is kind of misleading because there's nothing true about it. And then. Uh, Lama Yeshe said, and even the deceptive truth that you that you think you're seeing, that you think you're understanding now, that's not even the real deceptive truth that's there anyway. So we're even off. We're even off of the deceptive truth that could be maybe understood and enlightened beings see deceptive truth. And they see, like Nancy said about the cup, all the different angles, all the different positions. So, Oh, this person, they're, they're a holy being. And then if someone in the Sangha or if one of the students talk bad about them, that person is bad. Because they're holy. It's not true, really. You know, it's like, what is it? 65% of the world's population thinks that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a terrorist. Like, like has the status of Osama bin Laden. Because... The largest population in the entire world is in China. And the only information that you get in China is that His Holiness Dalai Lama is a terrorist. So that's true for them. 
and they don't have access to his teachings. I don't even remember what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, deceptive yeah. truth. Right? So that's a perfect example of deceptive truth. You know? And we think we really know the deceptive truth. Even the deceptive truth is totally wrong. Because we're not actually seeing there's so many different positions that could be taken by another person. So then in an, in an illusion way, things do things. And actually by seeing them do things, then we name them. You know, like, oh, Teddy, he's a photographer. He's a photographer because he takes photographs. So because he takes photographs, he's a photographer. So because he appears to take photographs, he's a photographer. So that makes sense. Then, of course, he's a photographer. Right? But then ultimately, not really. So in the illusion way, they do stuff. Now ultimately, not doing anything. Actually not doing anything at all. And all these equivalent, absolutely perfectly equivalent emptinesses of every single object in the room, all existing simultaneously, all not doing anything. It's just a screen. You know, so it's like in the movie theater, the screen is not doing anything. The screen is there. It's being projected upon it, on it, projected on it, or something, right? So that ultimately nothing touches. Ultimately nothing starts. Ultimately, you know, there, there is there there is no cause and effect relationship. Ultimately, nothing has any characteristic of its own. Emptiness is even empty, right? But then deceptively, then things touch. Deceptively. Then things work. I remember someone asked in one of Gessler's debate classes, and they said, "So does he?" said, "So does it? Does it exist?" I said, "It doesn't exist." Gessler said, and then someone said, "Wait a second! Deceptively, deceptively, it doesn't." Gessler said, "That's for suckers. That's cheap. And that's always what we're doing." I said, "Oh yeah, I understand what emptiness is." Yeah, it's empty, it's, it's empty, it's empty, but deceptively, I have this bill that needs to be paid in five days, and I'm about $500, not enough in my bank account. You know what I mean? But it's not. Deceptively, we don't even get it. We don't even get it. Deceptively, the moments still don't touch deceptively. Deceptively, things still come from past causes. Right? Deceptively still, in an instant, totally changed. Deceptively, you can take your deceptive body, walk it down the deceptive stairs, be living your deceptive life, and then in a split second, you can have a deceptive death because you got hit by the deceptive car. Right? All coming from past causes. So even deceptively, we're not getting it. You know what I mean? So obviously, how can we ever tame this afflicted state of mind? It's to think about the ultimate nature of things, right? Because we're already experts at misunderstanding. And we already know that misapprehending the object is the reason why we can have mental afflictions at all. And Lama James said, we keep believing things are out there without analyzing how it can possibly exist. Should I even talk about that right now? Because aren't we about to talk about this? No, I have none to choose. No, I have none to choose. In the reading, Manjushri gives these five steps to how we cycle, continue to cycle in the cycle. And it begins with root ignorance, and it ends with, you know, planning a karma, which will keep us in some sorrow. Um, 
uh, Maitreya gives six steps. It's the exact same thing, right? So Manjushri gives five steps, Maitreya gives six steps. Only comment I'm going to make because Holy Lama James always skillfully talks about this is enlightened beings, and this is really important. I, it's not really my place to say it because I don't understand it so well, but enlightened beings do not make mistakes, period. If you read in one teaching that there's five steps, and if you read it, that another enlightened being came and said six steps, how many times, how many ways can you divide the teachings? Is it one or is it many? You see? How many different ways can you teach ethics? Is it Buddhism, Catholicism, Christianity, Judaism, you know, um, Muslim, all these different things like that, right? So you can really take that and just see this is the perfect analogy. Even within Tibetan Buddhism, there's enlightened beings. One said six steps, one said five steps. Okay? That's all. So the, these are the steps of, of how you make the mistake. So Lord Manjushri's, in the reading you'll see it's five steps, but Lama Christi splits the first step into two steps. So she gives it to us in six steps. Just so you don't get confused. So this is Lord Manjushri. He says, number one, we make the mistake about everything around us. We see it as separate. Number two, this causes ideas and concepts to arise in the mind. Number three, we bring these things to mind incorrectly. Number four, we start to attach a self-nature to these things. Five is this causes a certain wrong view to arise. For example, that it will always make me happy. Number six, this causes our mentally afflicted state of mind. This doesn't always make me happy. And then here's Lord Maitreya's. Number one, you have a seed to see things as self-existent. Two, then you start then you start to see it as self-existent. So one is you have the seed, and then two is you do it. Then three, you start to feel an attraction or an aversion. And this is not like, you know, on the gross level of attraction or aversion. This is like you're drawn towards something or you're repelled from it, like even a, an amoeba experiences that. And then number four, because you feel attracted or not, you, do, you like or dislike it. Well, four is like just an extension of three. Five, you do something to collect karma towards these objects. And number six, you cycle in the cycle. Can you repeat uh, the third one from Maitreya? Uh, Maitreya? Mm -hmm. You start to feel an attraction or an aversion.
So first thing, right, you have a seed. In the past, you planted a seed within a wrong understanding, right? So it was infected like a virus. Past life, past life. Then when it came in this moment, then it was a seed to see things as separate. It's like this ingrained ignorance. It's like, this is the one thing that's actually not really your fault. Because it's so ingrained. It's just like samsara, first level thing. Ingrained in you is that you're going to see whatever arises as separate. Right? And then you attach a quality to it. When you dislike it or you like it, you want to push it away, you want to take it, and then you act on that. You act on that, you do you do the action, and then you've, unknowingly, you planted this same cause, and later it will also be result again to see something as separate from you. So we have to find in there, we can cut that. We can cut that. My holy lama, John Brady, always was saying, Samsara is this big circle, but it's made up of many, many, many tiny, tiny samsaras. Many tiny samsaras. And every time you break one, that tiny samsara is gone. That tiny samsara is gone. And it's like what Chris was talking about. You know, where it's like, it's coming from your past deeds, and that's the whole thing. If you have a jerk, then yeah, it came from some a quote, you being the jerk or whatever, right? And then you cut that in that moment, that's one cycle. It came all the way around and then it was cut and it's gone forever. Absolutely gone forever. Mostly if we have some habitual experience we're having, then we amass quite a few of these, you know? So, but the point is we do it step by step. So we here in this process, we have to find where where would you attack? Where would where do you think you would attack in this process? Any thoughts? Any ideas? I don't know. Okay. Like when if they say like so each moment of mine is like a ripening of a past karma and maybe that's even so where I'm seeing things as self existent. But then like how do you get in there edge wise? Is it all how can I plant a karma in the present? the future if my mind is all coming from past Good question. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the amazing questions. It's like, and I think we can have an endless debate about it. But one amazing thing is, that's asking that question is like, oh my God, the fact that you have the opportunity to mm -hmm. contemplate these things, they say it's like finding the Dharma is like being a turtle in a vast ocean and floating on the ocean is like a wedding. And you just, unknowing to you, you just decide to pop your head out of the water and you popped it up and you're up you're through the rain. That's how rare it is. That's how rare it is to be all of the conditions that have come together to have a moment of mind where you can you know, understand something with wisdom and do a virtuous deed is like, it's unfathomable. I mean, whether or not there's free will, you know, at least deceptively there is, right? Because, you know, I make, I feel like I make choices all day long, you know what I mean? And from when I started to receive the teachings until now, anger, down, 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 down. Negative reactions, down, 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 down. I'm still pretty annoying, but you know, <laughs> everything else going west and west, you know? So it's an amazing question. Do you have the question? I always ask that question. I ask every single one of the teachers that question, and they were always like, oh, like Camilo, I asked that question. He's like, I love that question. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Let us go way far. But you know, the karma is empty.
so and that's that's actually the perfect thing is in order to get in there edgewise we have to eliminate the seeds for seeing things as simple it's not just the view because the view is coming from causes and the only place where we can confront those and we can actually get in there like we brought Francis our son to the beach was his first time using the shovel like to get in there with the shovel and like get out the root uh -huh. is in balanced meditation it's really the only way you know because and I have very limited experience of this um, but you can reach places in your meditation and with your wisdom where you start to where you get a glimpse that you've never that you've been chasing the next moment forever that like it's this you you reach this like profound place where you see wow i am getting in their edgewise like i can rip out the root of all suffering you know, and uh, I remember His Holiness the Dalai Lama at the uh, Lama teaching, and, get, and we were there, and it's insane. But there's this one part where he's like, he was talking about like the nature of mind. So he said, "Oh, I have really limited experience." He said, "But, but sometimes when I sit and I sit and I just let everything get still, and then he would feel like there's like something." I saw there was like maybe something, something there, you know, so I think that's what we have to just keep trying to use balanced meditation, you know, and then Gesula, Geshe Michael, he always said, it's like driving a car, you know, like, and I, th this last weekend I drove the most I've ever driven, I've driven probably less than 10 hours in my entire life, and so I could never really relate it to that, and driving is hard. <laughs> it's hard and you have to keep going like this and then I realize like it really is like meditation just you keep going you're starting the metropolis like John and then you gotta keep driving and just keep adjusting and then you will get to the mountain you know you will get to an amazing amazing place and I don't, it's like it's an arena where all of your realizations can like go so deep where it's where where everything is where the seeds actually arise from it's like this very very pure kind of thing that are talked about in other teachings like pure 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 mind you can get there and you can like mess with the seeds down there like Nancy said because they're completely empty you know but until you get there <laughs> you like, or you go to the towards the median.
spot where you're not straining and you're, you're not too slouched either. It's like this sweet spot that you find. Children's book. I 
and the girl flies off of her roof. And she's flying all around New York, and she sees the the um, the Brooklyn Bridge, George Washington Bridge, <laughs> and she's like, when I fly around the roof, I feel like it's all mine. Like it, and the the the, the thing is my string of pearl necklace or whatever she said. But the point is, is it's all yours to give away. It's all yours to give away. Like most of the time when we look at these big buildings or we look at the world around us, then we're automatically thinking it's separate from us. And it's a perfect proof because we're thinking that belongs to someone else. How could I ever offer that to my teacher? You see, like you can go by um, a flower stand and you can just simply smell the flower and you can offer that smell to all the enlightened beings there are all all in the form of your teacher you know or all all in your in the form of your mom or whoever it is you know it's, it's literally it's all you so it's all yours to give away you see it's all yours to offer Um, that's all. There's other stuff. Try to think about it. It's a, it's a characteristic of everything you're looking at. It's right there. It's behind the veil of all those um, qualities you're seeing. Just think about it. Think about it as much as possible. I think it will be really good for the next class. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.